Welcome back. And I am excited because in the next two episodes, we're going to have a complete game loop. We got enemies going down a path, attacking that castle. We've got functioning range towers, shooting at those enemies, health for a castle, health for those enemies, and a game over screen with the ability to restart a game after game over. So let's do it. So we are going to build four different things in this one. One, we got to actually add the castle, which the enemies are going to try to attack. Then we need an enemy spawner. Once enemies are spawning, then those enemies actually need to be able to move down the path and then attack that castle. And then finally, we need to deal with health. Health of the enemies and health of the castle itself. Let's start with just trying to actually show a castle tile. Now remember, we are starting with an existing game. So look in the description and download the project if you don't have it already. This is what we're currently working with. This is what we want. We want to be able to show some sort of castle, like your home base. Now, if you've never made a game before, I don't really recommend starting here. I highly recommend the how to make a game with no experience tutorial. I'll put that in the description and also link it on the top right side of the screen. You'll see we're already working with a, a tile object and a tower object. I'm actually just going to duplicate that tower object, then drag in our sprite for the castle sprite. I'll also link the asset pack in the description if you haven't watched the previous episodes. Over in our map controller, we're already rendering out all of the tiles for the map. So now we just need to figure out which tile is going to render the castle. So I'm just going to hard code in which row and column where we want to place the castle for now. So you'll see right away, it is showing up on the screen. We're using the same process that we use to render the rest of the tiles, but it seems to be too low. So you'll remember, in general, we have this issue with sprites where you need to make sure that the origin is correct. So if you look at our previous tower, you'll see the origin is in the bottom middle. We need to do the same thing with this castle sprite. And then, yep, looks good. Now we need to actually uh, draw that path that leads up to it. So this is the path that the enemy is actually going to walk down. So I import it in another sprite. Make sure that the origin is set correctly. So the bottom of the diamond, essentially. Also make sure that the dimension matches our original tile. So 250 by 235. Yep, that looks good. Keep that in mind for any tile that you import, any tile sprite that we're going to import as part of this. Over in our map controller, we also have a tile index struct where we're keeping track of all of the, the sprites that we're importing in. Once we put it there, then we can update our map layout. Simple enough. We now have a new index too that shows that specific road sprite. And yep, this looks good. We'll have to deal with the highlighting and make sure that you can't place towers on top of these tiles. But in general, for the sake of drawing the map, this is exactly what we want. Now, that's just one road piece. So obviously, we need all variations of this. So we need, you know, the corner that's going to turn like this. And then we'll need um, the other straight roads, etc. You can go back and refer to old episodes if you need to. But when you import these sprites in, or before you import these sprites in, you may want to actually make sure that the dimensions are correct. So I'm using a sprite in this instance to make sure that it follows that same sort of 250 by 235. In general, they should actually be fine as is within uh, the sprite pack, but double check them just in case. Now I'm going to follow the same process here. So I imported two more sprites, make sure that they're registered within the tile index, make sure that the sprite is associated with the right one, the right asset, then update our map layout using the new index numbers that you set at the top. You'll see we have a similar sort of issue that we had with the castle. So again, follow the same process, make sure that the origin is up to date, bottom of the diamond. While we're in here, we might as well make sure that the collision mask is correct as well. So over in collision mask, set it to diamond and make sure that it matches that top diamond on our sprite. This will make sure that when we hover over it, that the rest of our code for highlighting tiles works. And it will allow us to actually, you know, set a tower on top of one of these tiles. And there we go. It looks great. So we've got those two different types of tiles updated in our map layout. Hovering still looks good. Now just go in and add in the rest. 
So again, just build out the path. And you don't have to build it exactly the way I'm building it out here. You can build it out, you know, however you'd like. Double check that everything looks good. Now, the only problem here is that we shouldn't actually be able to highlight those road tiles because we shouldn't be able to set towers on them. So look at our UI object and you'll see where we're actually checking for clicks. Check and see what's the sprite index of the focused tile. If it's a grass sprite, then let's only highlight in that case. Um, I can also pull it out into a, an easier to use function like can place. So again, we're looking at stopping the click. Another option actually is to just stop the focus in the first place. So instead of just preventing a click, we can use this new can place function up in our set focus code at the top of step to prevent them from ever setting focus. Let's see how that works. Now we've got a bug. So this kind of works. It's not letting us highlight it, but you can see it's actually sticking focus on whatever the last highlighted item was. This seems to only happen when we're coming off of one of the road sprites. It's, it still works when we're coming off of the map in general. Try to find the bug yourself here if you can. Just follow the logic along. Try to see where we're not potentially clearing focus. Now, I don't think this is actually the problem, but I do see one potential bug. So in our clear focus, we're not actually checking to see if focus tile is set. Now see, yeah, this still doesn't fix it, even if I check for it and return out. So the issue really has to be in our step function, I think. So I'm gonna actually flip the logic here. Before, if we're not hovering over any tile, then we clear the focus. Otherwise, we check if we can place the tile and we set focus. But in this new scenario, we are actually hovering over a tile it's just a tile that we're not allowed to place on. So we should still be clearing focus, even if we're hovering over a tile that we cannot place on. So the new logic is simple, right? If we can place on a tile, highlight it. If not, clear. Back in our can place function, if the tile is not set, then we cannot place on it. Otherwise, if it's set to grass sprite, then we can place on it. Now, looking good, okay. So it clears focus completely, if we hover over the road, if we're hovering over grass, still looks good and we can still set towers. Fantastic. One more potential bug that I've thought of is that if you've already placed a tower onto a tile, then we don't want to be able to place another tower. So let's check for that again in our can place function. This is going to prevent anyone from being able to highlight over it or be able to click and place another tile. And we might as well throwing a, a quick doc block here to explain what actually is placeable and is not. So here we go. Looks good. We can still place onto our grass sprites, but when we hover over the road or a castle or one of these existing uh, tower spots, then we can't place. All right, let's make some enemies. Again, see if you can try to figure this out on your own, and then I'll show you how I'm going to do it, or just one way to do it. Over in map controller, I'm going to add in a couple of variables. So one for how many enemies are we allowed to spawn, which I'll just set to one for now. And then how many have we already spawned? I'll create a spawn function and check how many have we spawned against how many are we allowed to spawn. And then if we haven't spawned enough, we're gonna create a new instance of this enemy object. So I've created two new assets, an enemy object and an enemy sprite. Our enemy object is just empty right now. All I've done is assign the sprite to the object. No events or anything else. Over in the sprite, also pretty simple to start. It's just a big circle. I didn't actually draw anything. I just used the circle tool and created a pink circle. It's a 64 by 64 sprite. And if you haven't already assigned it to the object, drag it over into the object. Now we're just using the X, Y of the map controller right now. That's not actually correct. We need to set a proper X, Y. So you'll see if we try to play this one, it, it's not actually showing anywhere. So it might be the positioning or it could be the depth or this code's never getting run in the first place. So we did put this over into its own function called spawn, but we aren't actually calling spawn. So let's create a step event for our map controller and stick that spawn call in there. I did also notice a, a bug. So I, I used the wrong variable name here. So it should be if enemies to spawn minus enemies. 
spawned. And there we go. We got an enemy on the screen. Now thinking about how we're calling this. So it's in a step event. Step events are just going to fire as fast as possible. We can use a quick debug message to see how often this uh, spawner code is actually getting called right now. If we run it, you'll see over in the console, look, it's getting called way too much. It's just getting called over and over and over. So you can't tell because those sprites aren't moving, but it's just stacking tons of them on top of each other. So one, let's actually make sure we're incrementing enemy spawned, which we weren't before. And now that looks good. So it's only getting called once. We can clean up our debug message, but now we need to figure out how to actually spawn this object into the right position because that X, Y, as we talked about, is not in the right spot. Once we've got it spawning on the right initial tile, then it's going to need to move along that path. But let's not worry about the movement right now. Let's just focus in on draw it on that first tile. So thinking about this a little bit, I'm going to pull in a new variable for the actual spawn location. So that's the tile position. So three over, one down. And we know we're going to actually need a reference to the tile object because that's what stores our x, y coordinate in the world space. So even if we know the tile position, which is, you know, the three, one, column three, row one, it doesn't actually help us with the pixel x, y coordinate. Let's pseudocode this out a bit. So assume we have access to the tile, which we'll have to figure out how to get that. Once we have that, then it'll be pretty straightforward. Instead of using the, the x, y of the map controller, we'll just use the exact x, y of the tile. So let's look back up where we're creating the tile instances. We iterate over our layout. We grab the sprite and then we create an instance of it, but we don't actually store a reference anywhere. So back where we create that tiles variable, we can just store instances directly in this tiles array. So it's going to be a multidimensional array. It's going to get populated by that draw map function. And then it's going to actually have a reference to the tile instance itself, which once we have that array, makes it pretty straightforward on how to access it. So we can reference tiles. We'll get first the correct row, and then we'll get the correct column from our spawn location that we stored earlier. Tile is now going to be a reference to the instance, which means our X and our Y should now be correct. So it's not showing up. We know that this code is getting run because we had debug messages earlier. I, I've run into depth issues a lot and we haven't solved it on this. So yeah, if we pull the depth back a, a bit, I just subtracted 10, you'll see it does actually show up now. You'll also notice that again, we have an origin issue. So it was drawing the sprite but it wasn't drawing it at the sprite's face. So I'm just going to bump it to the bottom middle. Let's run that again. And now the two origins are matching, right? So the origin of our enemy is matching the origin of our road sprite, which again is at the bottom of that diamond. Now we just need to pull it up a little bit because we want to make it look like the enemy's walking down the road. We don't want to actually have it off the, the end of the diamond there. So I'm not going to touch the origin. That's not how you'll adjust it. You'll actually, adjo you'll actually adjust it where we set the XY on instance creation. And then there we go. That looks great. So the bottom now matches right with the center of the road there. So we've got it positioned, which is great. Now we need to actually get some movement going. So move it down that road like we talked about. Again, Try to solve this problem yourself. Give it a shot before you just look at my solution. There's not necessarily a one right way. So the way I'm thinking about this is I want to store the path that it's going to be moving down. So, you know, we already have the spawn location. We can just store every single reference to the path it's going to walk down. So same sort of way, we can just store the row and the columns of each row tile. So it'll look something like this. 
we can just give that to our enemy, pass that in via the instance create. Then our enemy will actually have reference to the path that it needs to walk down, meaning that within our enemy, it can control its own movement. So I'm going to give it a create and a step event. Over in our step event, write out a little bit of pseudocode. So we're going to need its current target, essentially the target tile that it's currently moving towards. I'm going to create a function for that. So we're going to fetch the current target. It'll return either a struct or undefined. If we have any elements in our path, it's going to return back that struct, which will be the row in the column. Right, so the workflow is now check for current target. If it's undefined, bail out. Otherwise, we're going to move into this next set of code here. So I'm going to grab an instance of our map controller because I want to use that to get the current tile. If you haven't seen my video on passing variables between objects, I would highly recommend it for this type of code. Think about what we did for spawning. Spawning needed to get access to the tile. So we created that tiles array. So currently the map controller is essentially the owner of all of those tiles. So we need to go to that to get at the tile. So right now I just reference this get tile function, which does not exist yet. I'm going to give it the row and the column. Now let's actually make that go over to our map controller create a new function called get tile. It's going to take in a row and a column, just like we were passing in from our enemy. And then we can access that tiles array the same way that we did earlier when spawning. Actually, we can just completely replace how we were accessing tiles before. Instead, we can just use that get tile function to make it consistent and maybe a little more readable. I don't know. Subjective. Now back in our enemy, we've got our tile. Let's uh let's just run it and make sure that this code is actually running. Make sure that we don't have any immediate errors before we do anything with it. And now I'm going to use this move towards point function. So that's just going to take in the XY coordinate of the tile. And it's going to take in a speed to make this slightly more readable. I'm going to pull that out into a variable called move speed. Clean up a bit. We don't need all of these comments here. Again, let's give it a run. And yep, cool. Looks good. Okay, so it's moving towards the next tile, but you'll see it's again doing that. It's, it's moving towards the origin, not the center of the road. So you saw this with our spawning where we are actually pulling it up a little bit, the y value. So I'm going to do the same thing here. Once we have that, then it's actually moving towards the center of the next road tile. And then it freezes because we're not setting the next target or moving the next target forward. We can check how close we are to the target like this and then call something like a next target function. Next target will essentially just pop the top item off of the path array. Let's do a shift. So for certain a distance away, we're going to call that next target, which is going to pop the top of the path. Otherwise, we're going to move towards the current target. Let's see how that works. So we're still freezing. We are moving, but it doesn't seem like we're ever entering that uh, if condition. So one in our if point distance call, we're not actually using the same x, y that we're using and move towards because it's that same sort of Y issue where we're adjusting for the, uh, the origin. So I'm going to pull both of those out into their own variables, target X and target X and target Y, and then update everywhere where we're, where we are referencing tile.x and tile.y. I'm also going to throw in a little debug message and show that point distance since it didn't seem like it was ever evaluating to true. So let's see. We're moving, we're moving, we're moving. And we do get below two. So that does get called, but we're getting an error. We're having a problem because it's saying that array shift doesn't exist. 
but which which unfortunately is a version issue so the version of game maker that i'm currently using doesn't have a race shift now yours might you can still test this code and see if it works but otherwise one option is we can just use an index instead of a race shift so i'm going to store i'm going to store the target index at the top of our create i'm going to adjust both of these functions so current target i'm going to adjust and say if our target index is less than the length of our array then let's fetch it otherwise it's out of bounds and we return undefined for next target we can just simply increment target index assuming that there is actually somewhere to go so again we can do this check if target index is still less than the array length then we can increment it otherwise we're just going to do nothing because we're already at the end of our path running it and it looks good so it's made it through the first couple of tiles it looks like it's setting current target let's make sure you know it can change directions so it goes around the corner correctly goes around the other corner correctly and uh, it's not good okay so this this has to be another depth issue so we set minus 10 on the depth in our map controller spawner i'm gonna just make it really negative so i'm gonna set it to a hugely negative number for now force it to always show up in the front of everything and then run uh, run it again and it looks good so it makes it all the way so we will have to deal with depth sorting at some point. Now, this is happening, which is, it looks like it's still continuing to move. So it's either trying to still find the next tile or it's somehow, it's just speed is getting locked and it's still calling that move towards point somehow. So when you run into these type of issues, again, you can use some debug messaging. You can also use the debugger if you're comfortable with it. It is much better, but for the sake of uh, simplicity, for people who haven't dealt with the debugger before, I'm still going to just continue to use these debug messages. Now, if we see, it looks like everything is actually correct based off these debug messages. So it's getting stuck on that last target, which actually... It is okay, and it's it should be hitting this if target equals un can, uh, undefined, if target equals undefined. So what I think it actually is is the speed. This is, again, just something you'll run into with GameMaker every once in a while. Because of move towards point, it sets a speed. So we, if we wanted to stop moving, we need to set speed back to zero. And, yep, so that's the issue. So those things are are very difficult to find. Those are are difficult bugs and errors to find. It just comes from experience with working with Game Maker. Now let's deal with attacking. I want to assign some health to our castle because we know an enemy is going to attack it. So create event on the castle, set hit points. Just I'm going to set them to 100 for now. Over in our UI, I'm going to create a draw GUI event. This is because I want to draw the castle's health on the GUI layer. So naturally, I mean, this could technically live anywhere, but the UI seems to make the most sense to me. Here, I'm going to grab an instance of the castle, the window width and height, and then I'm just going to draw some text. So essentially, the text is going to be the castle health, just like that on the top right of the screen. Looking back at our, looking back at our enemy object, I'm going to split our step function into a couple sections here. So one is going to be that movement code that we wrote earlier. And then at the top, I'm going to deal with uh, attacking our attack code. So again, I need, a, I need reference to the castle because the castle has its own hit points. If the enemy is a certain distance from our castle, then let's attack it. I'm going to kind of arbitrarily set 50 as the distance. Then we also want to make sure that, again, because we're in a step function, that we are not just attacking as fast as possible over and over. So I'm going to check the actual time. So I only want to attack 
every two seconds. If we're within that two second window, let's subtract one off of the castle hit points. And then each time we attack, let's reset our time since last attack. Time since last attack, we need to actually define. So let's jump over into our create event for an enemy and default it to current time. Give this a run. You can keep an eye on the top right to see what the castle health currently is. And nothing. Nope. Okay. Debugging it a little bit again. Let's see how close we are to the castle and see if this if is actually getting triggered. So I'm just going to debug print the uh, point distance. So the distance that the enemy is away from the castle. Give it a run and you'll see over in the output how close we are and it's only getting to about 163. So that's our problem. So let's just bump that up. Also, since these are variables that we might potentially want to adjust at some point and we want to make this a little bit more readable, let's pull all that out. So we're going to store the attack range, which is 200 pixels, the attack strength, which is one because we're reducing hit points by one. And then essentially like the attack uh, speed, like how often we're attacking. So I'm going to store two seconds or 2000 milliseconds and then adjust that if statement to use the attack speed instead of just the number. Clean up. Don't need some of these comments. Run it again. And it looks like it's working. So you'll see every two seconds we're doing one hit onto the castle per enemy. This is just a little nice to have, but we can also create a font for our GUI. So it, it is a little bit small to read. So if we want to adjust the size, we can create a font, set the size of it. So I'm going to bump it up to 40. I'll leave everything else the same. This one's just called default font. And then over in our draw GUI, I'm going to use, I'm going to use draw set font. Which then, yeah, just makes it easier to read for people who need glasses like me. Over our enemy, if our enemy is currently attacking, mean it just hit, then I just want to return out. I don't want to go down to the movement code if we're currently doing an attack. So that's why I'm just going to return out there over in our castle. I'm going to reduce hit points down to 10 so that we can test uh, getting to zero. And thinking about getting to zero, I already know that this is going to be a problem, right? So castle hit points, if we just keep decrementing, it's going to go negative, which doesn't really make sense. So we can use this handy max function to not let it go below zero. And let's see it tick all the way down. And it should just freeze. Yeah, so... It's not going below zero. That code is still running, but we're also not doing anything when it actually hits zero, which normally would be like a game over. So working exactly the way that we want for now. And then this is what comes next. We need to actually add attacking from the towers so that we can kill these enemies. And then we want to do something with the game over. Trigger a game over screen, let the player restart it. All of these fun things to get to a complete game loop which happens in the next episode. See you then.